and then start with the Rayleigh scattering. Um, so let's start with the um, idea of uh, creation and annihilation operators. Let me say, first of all, thanks, Sandra, that, that if we were in the, if we, when we're in the continuum limit, the chance of two identical particles having exactly the same momentum is zero. And so one can essentially blow away all the hard stuff in the combinatorics and just say, well, the boson creation operators commute and the, and the uh, fermion creation operators anti commute. And, it's, and, and you're essentially done. But there are important cases where box quantization is relevant, such as in laser physics, quantum optics, and uh, dense matter physics. And also, just to tie the formalism of quantum field theory to quantum mechanics, it's worthwhile doing the box quantization. Um, so, what we'll assume then is that P is 2 pi h bar n over L. So N is a vector of integers, L is the length of the edge of the box. And then the creation operator takes the vacuum represented by zero or the state with no particles into the state with one particle. And in these notes, since I didn't want to fuss with bold face type for every vector, I used P to represent the three vector plus any spin index. And that gets me off the hook. I don't have to use the bold face type. Is that a question? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't have my long distance glasses on, so I couldn't tell. All right, the state uh, P, P prime, remember, is 1 over root 2, particle 1 in the state P, particle 2 in the state P prime. We're talking bosons first, so let me write that down. Plus 1 in the state P prime, 2 in the state P. Okay, so that's the state. And the creation operator is defined as taking the state P prime into this, into this state P, P prime. So that's, that's basically the definition of the creation operator for bosons, at least for bosons acting on the state, the state of one boson. Um, now, this state, P prime, P, P prime is normalized if P is not equal to P prime. Okay. But if P is equal to P prime, then the state P, P is 1 over root 2, 1 P, 2 P, plus 1 P, 2 P which is square root of 2, 1 P, 2 P. So this state is not normalized when P is equal to P prime. Instead, it has norm 2. <coughs> OK, the normalized state is the state that we'll write as 2 P, two particles in, in state P. And that is just the state 1 P, 2, P, which is normalized. Okay. And so now if we combine these various um, rules, namely this rule, which is supposed to hold whether P is equal to P prime or not, um, this rule, and then this rule, what we've got is A dagger on P takes the state P into the state PP, which is what this equation says when P prime is P. But then that state is square root of 2 times the state 2P. So this is the rule that, that we get. Okay? And 
To do it one more time, I don't think I'll go through the common torts for the general case. And the creation operator takes the state P prime and double prime. A of A dagger P takes that into the state P, P prime, P double prime. And now that state is 1 over the square root of 3 factorial, and then this huge sum. I don't know if I have the strength to write it down. 1, P, 2, P prime, 3, P double prime, plus 1, P, 2, P double prime, 3, P prime. And then you have plus 1, P prime, 2, P, P, 3, P double prime, plus, and then it's the same thing as this, but you interchange P and P double prime. And then finally, 1, P double prime, 2, P, 3, P double prime. And then plus where you interchange P and P double prime. No, P and, here this is wrong, P and P prime. So the last one is 1, P double prime, 2, P prime, 3, P. Okay, so that's that state, and that's a normalized state when all the P's are different. But, but the norm of the state P, 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 the state P, P, P is 3 factorial times 1, P, 2, P, 3, P. And the normalized state is the state 3, P, which is 1, P, 2, P, 3, P, and no sum. And so now if you combine these things, what you've got is a dagger of P on the state P, P is equal to P, P, P. And we can rewrite that then as a dagger of P. We know this one is square root of 2, 2, P. And this one, this one is square root of 3 factorial of the state P, P. And so dividing through the a dagger of P on the state P, P is square root of 3, 3, P. Okay, if you do this infinitely many times, you eventually get a dagger of P on the state N, P is equal to square root of N plus 1, the state N plus 1, P. And by other, I don't think it's wise to go through all the details in these notes. You're invited to do that. A of P on the state N, P is square root of N, N minus 1, P. And we've got the commutation relations A of P, a dagger of P is equal to, well, P prime, delta P, P prime. Okay, so that's the story for bosons. The story for fermions is conceptually much simpler, but they're all minus signs. And those minus signs can drive one mad in a hurry. But let me just do it really quickly. So first of all, a dagger of P on the back of the interstate P. And then a dagger of P on the state P prime is the state P, P prime. And this is 1 over root 2. Now we're doing fermions. One P, P, P prime minus one P prime, two P. 
And this is normalized if P is not equal to P prime. Um, I've got a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll so do the reward first. Oh, and also I forgot to pass out the trackers. Can you catch these? Yeah. Okay, so you have the creation operator on N P. Yes. And that N is the number? Right. It's like this three P but and over it, here, the state two P. The state two P and three P, these are the normalized states of two particles in the same state. Is that different from the like two colon P? I'm I'm trying to it, it looks like the line of Oh, okay, okay, you're right. You're right. The there's two di there are two different there are two different things happening here in the notation. This one colon P means particle one is in the state P. Or let's go to this one. Particle one is in the state here, maybe you should turn your camera on here. Particle one is in the state P, particle two is in the state P prime, and this state is particle one is in the state P prime, and particle two is in the state P. It wasn't any prime. Yeah. That's what that one means. Then, when we have, and that's fine if p is not equal to p prime, the state is normalized. But if p is equal to p prime, we have to say p p. And um, that's this. And these states are the same, so they just add. You get a root two. So that state, the state that we sort of carefully defined, is not normalized when the states are right, when the Physical properties are identical. Momenta are the same. Momenta and spin index are the same. So we define a normalized state. The normalized state is two particles in state P. And that's 1P, 2P. 1 is in P and 2 is in P. And then what you see when you put this all together is a dagger of P on the state P is square root of 2 times this normalized state 2P. And then over here, a dagger on the normalized state 2p is the square root of 3 times the normalized state 3 particles in state p. Okay, with fermions, once again, this state here is normalized if p is equal to p prime. So p p prime, p p prime equals 1 if p is not equal to p prime. But the state p p is 1 over root 2, 1 p, p p, minus 1 p, 2 p, and that's just 0. So, so the state p p for fermions is just simply the 0 state. And this, of course, is how we execute exclusion.
zero. And this anti-commutator is equal to, it's also written as A of B, A of B prime, commutated over the plus sign. And what it means, of course, is A of B, A of B prime, plus A of B prime, A of B, all the way up to zero. Same thing with the anti-commutator, a dagger of B, a dagger of B prime equals zero. And then you can also show that A of B, a dagger of B prime, anti-commutator is delta B prime. And I didn't fill in all the details in this handout, but I'm sure you can do it if you put your mind to it. Anyway, so that's the connection between the quantum field theory formalism of creation annihilation operators and the quantum mechanical formalism. And it's unfortunate that in many, many texts, there's one text on quantum field theory where they just start with the A and A daggers, and then the quantum mechanics books finish with this formalism and don't introduce the creation annihilation operators. One physicist at Stony Brook named Brown, Gene Brown, wrote a whole book on introducing this formalism into nuclear physics. All right, let's do Thompson scattering. Let me tell you what Thompson scattering is. These names, I really don't like these various names because the name doesn't say anything. I mean, there's nothing about Thompson that describes the process. It could have been Mickelson or Faraday or Maxwell, and the physical process would still be the same. So the process is what's important. And I think you can be forgiven if you forget the names of all of these processes. And I think we should have a rule in the department never to ask a question in which you need to know who wrote the key paper on any given process. In any event, this process is for the scattering of a photon off an atom, and the idea is that the scattering is at energies that are above optical, but still low enough so that you don't need to treat the atom relativistically and the electron relativistically, and also low enough so you can still do the dipole approximation. You remember that if the electron has an energy of 2 or 3 eV, the dipole approximation, that is to say k dot x, is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 for optical frequencies. So you can go up from optical frequencies by a factor of 10, and you still have 1 over 100, which is great accuracy. And you can even go higher by maybe a factor of 50, and then, well, it's 1 over 20, but when you square it, that's 1 over 40, so it's pretty good. In any event, Thompson scattering is the domain of Thompson scattering, and it's simpler than Rayleigh scattering, which is the scattering of lower energies. The process that I'm going to look at, though, is also involved in Rayleigh scattering. So let's just look at this. I equals 1 to n minus q over n, p sub i dot a at x i, 0, times 0, plus q squared over 2m, a vector squared of x i, 0. So this is the interaction, actually, of both Rayleigh and Thompson scattering, and we're considering then the process a plus an atom of state a plus a photon goes to an atom of state b plus a photon k prime. And I'm going to focus first on the – well, let me show you what the picture actually involves. 
This term we've been neglecting all along because it has Q squared in it, and Q is small. The charge of the electron in the natural units is small. The square of the charge of the electron in the natural units is more than 137. So we've been ignoring this and only using this term in all the calculations we've been doing. But now in this case, this term actually plays a role. And if we draw diagrams, the atom comes along, goes off, or actually it's an individual electron that comes along. A photon comes in, another photon comes out. That's what this picture gives us. The electron is only referred to by the position xi. This is called a seagull diagram. I assume there are two L's in the seagull, is that right? On the other hand, we can get the same physical effect by using this diagram twice. So this one works in first order perturbation theory. First order perturbation theory. This one only works in second order. And so it's going to be more complicated. But when you do it, there are two diagrams. A photon K comes in. Time is going this way. And photon K goes out, atom B goes out. That's one diagram. There's another diagram that can happen. A, B. Photon K can be absorbed here. And photon K prime can go out there. And the reason is that we're going to, in second order perturbation theory, put in a complete set of states. And that complete set of states can either be states with no photons and all the atomic states, or all the atomic states and two photons. And we'll see that. We'll see that toward the end of the hour if I hurry up. OK. But this term in first order gives this diagram already. And it's quite an interesting process in itself. So we have K prime B, the scattering operator T0, Ka, minus I over H bar as usual, integral 0 to T, T prime. K prime B, EI, H0 matter plus H0 field, T prime over H bar. A sum over the J electrons, over the N electrons, Q squared over 2N, A vector at XJ times 0 squared. Well, we've got a big board here. E to the, let's see, is this, I can't see, is the camera still turned up? Pretty close. OK. E, thanks. E to the minus I, H0 matter plus H0 field, T prime over H bar, and then the state Ka. So that's the amplitude in first order. And now we can rewrite that as minus I over H bar, Q squared over 2N, an atomic matrix element, K prime B, sum J equals 1 to N, A of XJ and 0 squared, Ka, times this time integral. And the time integral is 0 to T, T prime. And when this H0N acts to the left and over here to the right, we get E to the I, B minus EA, T prime over H bar. And then the H0F acts on the K prime over K. And altogether, we have E to the I, EB plus H bar omega prime, T 
minus EA minus H bar omega T prime over H bar. And then canceling the IH bar, we get minus T squared over 2M T prime B sum over the N. That's J equals 1 to N. A of X squared equals 0. K of A. And now this is just EDI. I'm just going to write this as delta E T over H bar minus 1 over delta E. Where delta E is this thing here. Now this atomic matrix element, let's look at it explicitly by itself. K prime B sum J equals 1 to N. A squared of X squared equals 0. K of A. Well, what is this? Remember the A, maybe I should write the electromagnetic field here just to remind you. A of X and 0 is sum over polarization and wave number, wave vector. H bar over 2 epsilon 0 B omega to the 1 half. Epsilon R of K. A bar of K. E to the I, K dot X. Plus the permission to contribute, which would be K R star. K R dagger. E to the minus I, K dot X. I suppress the K in the second term. So what this gives us is the H bar over 2 epsilon 0 B root omega omega prime. Times K prime B sum J equals 1 to N. Epsilon of K. K of K. E to the I, K. K dot X to A plus epsilon star. A dagger of K. E to the minus I, K dot X to A. Squared K of A. And what I should have here, of course, is I'm being a little bit. Well, the term that's important actually is this. That is to say, we want to create the K prime and annihilate the K. So effectively, this is what we've got. And the term that does that is not the A squared term, not the A dagger squared, but instead the cross product. And then there are two of those cross products. And again, K is not equal to K prime. If we make the dipole approximation, these guys turn into one. And so this thing is H bar over 2 epsilon 0 B root omega omega prime. And now what you notice is once we make the dipole approximation here, this is important. Once we make the dipole approximation, there are no more atomic variables in here. So we've got the state A. Everything here refers to the photons. Then the atomic state B. And so what we've got is K prime B just a sum on J from 1 to N. But there's no J index anymore. It's just epsilon K, AK, plus epsilon star K prime, A dagger K prime squared AK. And so the atomic variables just give us delta AB. 
The fact that there are N in use, there's nothing, there's no J here, so this N just gives us an N. So we get N H bar delta AB. There's going to be a 2 from there, so the 2 cancels. Epsilon 0 B root omega omega prime. And what's left is epsilon of K dot epsilon star of K prime. And then the matrix element K prime, a dagger K prime of K prime, sorry, A of K, K. And remember, A of K, this thing just turns this, this thing is just equal to the vacuum, and by emission conjugation of the adjoint relation, this is just equal to the vacuum, so this is just the number of one. So the amplitude here is just N H bar delta AB. Let me just check my notes to make sure I haven't gone off the reservation, as they say. Epsilon R of K dot epsilon star of K prime, R prime over epsilon 0 B root omega omega prime. Okay, so I didn't make any mistakes. Okay, so that's the matrix element. The rest of this, of course, is the pre-factor minus Q squared over 2M, and then the post-factor, which is this thing, which essentially generates an energy-conserving delta function. So our probability, P of T then, is Q squared over 2M squared, N H bar over epsilon 0 B squared, delta AB, no point in squaring, omega omega prime, epsilon R of K dot epsilon R prime star of K prime squared, and then 4 sine squared delta E T over 2 H bar divided by delta E squared. And we use our usual delta function formula, and we get that this is, and the delta function formula, we already have delta AB, so the energy-conserving delta function says that omega has to equal omega prime. And so this is just omega squared. And we can rewrite things, in fact, as pi T over 2 H bar, Q squared N H bar over M epsilon 0 B omega squared delta AB. Let me just write this as epsilon prime star squared, and then delta of H bar omega prime minus H bar omega. And so the rate is just P of T over, or over T if you want, or just D by D T of that, and that is pi over 2 H bar, this thing squared, and let me just not write the whole thing again, ditto. All right, the total rate, though, is a sum over polarizations in the final state. Well, let's see, the question is, so let me not sum over polarizations. Let us say that, for the moment, that we know the polarization of the initial photon, we measure the polarization of the final photon, so then we don't do anything like that, but we sum over the final states, so that's an integral V, an integral DQ of K over 2 pi Q W hat. And so that is pi over 2, 1 over 2 pi Q, H bar over V, integral of Q squared N 
over M epsilon zero omega squared delta AB. Let's go on line, I guess, for a minute. Polarization factor delta of H bar omega prime minus H bar omega d cubed K. Now, what's this d cubed K? Well, H bar omega is H bar KC. So we want to write d cubed K, because we've got an H bar omega here, as, of course, it has a K squared. But now we're going to write dK as dH bar omega, and then, of course, d omega, capital omega, solid angle, divided by H bar C. So that's what we substitute for this. In fact, I might as well just do it on one line. So I'm going to put in a K squared d omega, dH bar omega, and then we have a 1 over H bar C. OK, so that's our whole expression for the rate. It looks sort of complicated, but in fact, the energy conserving delta function just wipes out the integral. And all we have is d omega. So what we get then is that the differential scattering cross-section is v. Oh, and we have to divide by the flux. The flux is, we have one photon coming in, so the flux is C over volume. So we have, dividing by that, we have a prefactor v over C, and then pi h bar over 2, 1 over 2 pi cubed, 1 over v, q squared n over m, epsilon 0 omega squared, delta a b, epsilon dot epsilon star squared, k squared over h bar C. So that's all there is there. And we clean this up a little bit. It's k squared over 16 pi squared c squared, q squared n over m, epsilon 0 omega squared, delta a b, epsilon epsilon star times squared. OK. Remember that when you go from SI units to natural units, q squared is 4 pi epsilon 0 alpha h bar C. And so when we put these things in, what we get is d sigma d omega is equal to k squared n squared over 16 pi squared c squared times 4 pi alpha h bar C over m omega squared, delta a b, epsilon dot epsilon star squared. OK, this stuff collapses enormously and turns into simply n squared alpha h bar over c m squared, delta a b, epsilon sub r of k dot epsilon sub r prime k prime star epsilon dot epsilon squared. So that's the expression. Now this thing sitting here, alpha h bar over c m, actually is a famous parameter that mesmerized physicists in the 19th century or early 20th century. And it's called the classical radius of the electron. And it's approximately 2.82 Fermi's or 2.82 times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. The reason that Fermi introduced this unit or somebody else, I guess he started using it and people named it after him because he had done 
not so much in nuclear physics. Anyway, so it's 2.82 times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. So 10 to the minus 13 centimeters is the typical range of a nuclear, the nuclear force, and that's uh, called one term. So the, uh, the classical radius of the electron is around three fermis. It, <coughs> frankly, has nothing to do with the actual size of the electron, but it's a, para it's a parameter that does show up. And so this differential cross-section, as we expect then, is, if I just write it down one more time, is d sigma d omega is equal to n r zero squared delta a b times epsilon dot epsilon star prime, let me just do the time from square. And so this is a, we expect this thing to be an area, indeed it's an area because it's a radius squared. Um, notice this n, n though. That's the number of electrons in the atom. In fact, in fact I should have used probably z because for a neutral atom, in fact that's what we're talking about here as a neutral atom. For a neutral atom, uh, z is, um, is the number of electrons, the number of protons in the nucleus. So there's a, a remarkable effect here, namely the scattering cross-section is proportional to the, num the square of the number of uh, electrons in the atom. And um, that is, uh, that's a big deal. Um, because, for example, it means that uh, an oxygen atom scatters, uh, so d sigma d omega for oxygen is effectively 64 times d sigma d omega for hydrogen, the hydrogen atom. And in fact, this shows up in um, studies of, uh, in, in biophysics and molecular biology, uh, people want to know what the function of uh, various proteins are, functions of various proteins are, so they form crystals of the proteins, and then once they have a crystal of a certain size, they put it in a, uh, an x-ray beam and uh, rotate it over various angles and keep track of all the uh, scattering and this is this is this technique that was introduced by Bragg back around the early part of the last century called X-ray crystallography, and um, it's as I said, the technique is 100 years old, and it's one physicist, almost Alamos, Hans uh, Fraunhofer, that said they've had 100 years to learn how to cover up their mistakes. Um, anyway, uh, what you see when you get a uh, you, if you go to the protein data bank and you get the output of the results of the electrocrystallographic, the X-ray crystallographic study of a particular protein, there are no hydrogens. And the reason is that the hydrogen scatters only 164th as much as the oxygen and maybe 136th as much as carbon and uh, one forty-ninth as much as nitrogen, and so they just don't see the hydrogen. So they have to infer the hydrogens where the locations are. And so in the actual experimental uh, data, you don't, you know, you just don't see the hydrogen. They don't miss the hydrogen. So the location of the hydrogen atoms at all. Anyway, um, so so far we've just been uh, doing this for exact uh, polarization. Let's now suppose that we um, sum over the final polarization, which is almost always done. So we're going to sum over r prime of epsilon sub r of k dot epsilon r prime of k prime squared star. And this then is epsilon r star of k times 1 minus k hat prime, k hat prime transpose epsilon to bar of k. Remember, this is a trick that I 
showed you a couple of times ago. And so this is epsilon 1 star dot epsilon. Well, that's just 1 minus epsilon r of k dot k prime hat um, squared. That's the value squared. And um, so then d sigma d omega for, the, for, the, for this case is n r 0 squared times 1 minus the absolute value of k prime hat dot epsilon r of k. So this is where we know the initial polarization of the photon. We have polarized beam, but we just sum over the final polarization. If the initial beam is unpolarized, then we have to um, then we go further and um, we we sum oh, we average over the so we have to perform the average of the sum over the initial polarizations and uh, the average of one is of course one so we just average this term. And so this is the average of k prime hat dot epsilon r of k absolute value squared. Okay, well let me let me take this thing up to here. This is then one half k hat prime into the matrix one minus k hat dot k hat transpose k hat prime. And so this is just simply one half one minus k hat dot k hat prime squared. And so now this thing becomes d sigma d omega. This is completely unpolarized then. Is number of electrons times the classical radius of the electron times this one minus a half times one minus k hat dot k hat prime squared. Well, k hat dot k hat prime is just the angle between the, um, let us say, the initial beam k and then the scattered photon k hat prime. This is just the scattering, the cosine of the scattering angle since these are unit vectors. And so this, let me, let me switch to z. It's z r zero squared. And then the rest of this one minus a half is just a half. And then plus a half cosine squared theta. This is the scattering angle. And we're well, writing a little bit more nicely. Z R zero squared times one plus cosine squared of theta. So at zero degrees and at 180 degrees, uh, cosine is one, and we get that this thing is. So this goes to. Uh, this becomes a 2, and this is just z r 0 squared at theta equals of 0 and uh, pi. On the other hand, they, at, at 90 degrees and 180 degrees, well, it's just 90 degrees, 90 degrees, uh, this is 0, and we get a 1 half z r 0 squared theta equals the pi over 2. So the polarization, so for everything unpolarized, the polarization effects um, amplified by a factor of two forward and backward scattering. Now the total cross section, well, we just have to integrate this. So the total cross section is an integral d sigma d omega d omega. So that's two pi for the for the azimuth angle phi. We then integral minus integrate minus one to one dx z r zero squared a half one plus x squared. Here I'm using x equals cosine theta. 
And if you do that in row, to make a long story short, you get e pi over 3, z on 0 squared is the total cross section. Now, actually, the thing Thompson calculated, Thompson calculated the scattering of a photon or an electromagnetic wave, effectively, off a free electron, a single free electron. And he got this number over z to 1 um, semi-classically. So um, this is a case where the semi-classical treatment, at least for one free electron, gives you the right answer. I don't know, I don't know what he got for um, a whole atom. I imagine you'd get that right semi-classically. But I don't know. OK, so that's, um, that's the end for Thomson scattering. Any questions before I start, Ray Big problem here is board space. Um, let me let me go over here just just to start. Well, no, no, let me not go over there. Let me just take my notes. Um, so what are we what are we going to do? We're, we're we're considering the same process now. It's just that we're now at a lower energy, uh, so that we have to consider the second order perturbation theory. We have to consider p dot a in second order perturbation theory. So what that looks like is this. P k prime s of p in zero a k and it's minus i over h bar minus i over h bar squared Integral 0 to t, pt1. Integral 0 to t1, pt2. Remember, this thing is supposed to be time ordered. We're going to time, we're time ordering, it, time ordering it explicitly here. This is then v k prime. And I've got an e to the i h0 matter plus h zero field T one over H bar. I'm gonna write it that way, which is kind of crazy, but anyway. Okay, times minus Q over well, we have to have a sum here. So we have a sum uh, over I is one to N P sub I dot A of x i and zero e to the minus i, and now we're going to stick in a well. E to, let me just put e to the minus i. H zero matter plus h zero field t one over h bar. And now because we're going to have um, a product, we're going to have another p dot a. What we're going to do is put in a complete set of states here. And to, to do this a little bit simply, I'm going to write this complete set of states in the following way. I'm going to first of all say it's a sum over complete sets of atomic states, no photons. That corresponds to the middle diagram over there. Plus a sum over atomic states but now states with two photons. And so they can have C, they can have a uh, K and a K prime. So these are our intermediate states. And then in the final thing, we've got a sum J equals one to N and it should have been Z, pj dot A of xj and 0. And I forgot the minus q over m. So I'll just skip here. Minus q over m. And then we finally have 
time t to the minus i h0m plus h0x t2 over h bar. And then the initial state, so there's a typo for you. It's h and not ck. And I think I also left out, right, I left out here. So let me erase some of the previous constant stuff and stick it here. e to the i h0 matter plus h0 theo t1 over h bar. So this, these three Hamiltonians exponentiated around the p dot a put this in the interaction picture at time t1 and this in the interaction picture at time t2. This is a t2. Okay? Is that more or less clear? I'll try to get these notes online, certainly by Wednesday. All right. Well, there are two different, the simplest way to do this is to treat the h0 matter and the h0 field differently. The h0 matter, we don't want that coming through these operators here because as I said to you in one lecture several, a couple of weeks ago, the h0 matter is going to do crazy things to the argument of the field operator here. Now the dipole approximation, that doesn't make any difference. But in any case, just to keep the computation straight, the h0 matter, as before, is going to act directly on the eigenstates of h0 matter in the state, the atomic state B, the atomic state C, and the atomic state A. On the other hand, the h0 field can work much more simply if it just turns the A into the interaction picture. And so here, why don't you swing the camera over here. So what we're going to do is take this P to the I h0 field T over H bar A at x0 E to the minus I h0 field T over H bar. And all that does is put a minus omega T here. And over here, it puts this in the K dot X minus omega T like that. And so that's all it does there. So that's the next step here. And so let me first erase. Are there any questions? All right. So what we've got then is P prime K prime and the S operator KK minus I over H bar squared integral 0 to T integral 0 to T1 D T2 sum I J I'm going to revert back to Z P K prime so then we have E to the I E B 
minus BC, P1 over H1. And then we have, I'm going to cancel the minus sign in front of the minus Q over N. We've got two of them. So I'm going to have, or in fact better, why don't I just put Q here and N there and pull them out of the picture completely. So we've got here P dot A of X and T. And now we've got this big identity operator, which is sum over atomic states, plus sum over atomic states, K and K prime. In other words, it's atomic states plus two photons. And then we have PJ dot A of XJ and T. Now, this is T2, T1, and this is T2. And then we have B, K, EBI, EC minus EB, T2 over H bar. Okay. Well, what's going to happen then, in this term here, all you're going to use here is the annihilation operator for the photon of momentum K and polarization R. And this will give, this middle diagram then, will give this picture. K comes in, A comes in. This is C then. This is B. K prime goes out. And so the, apart from the time phase factors, what you're going to get is that B, K prime, E dot A of, say, X, I, and T1, C, C, E dot A of X, J, T2, A, K. This then is going to be, remember the factors from both of them are going to give us a factor H bar over 2 epsilon 0 square root of omega, omega prime. And then we're going to have B, or let me leave the K prime in there, P dot epsilon star sub R of K R prime and K prime, K dagger R prime of K prime, E B I K prime dot X I minus omega prime T one.
But now we can't toss, we don't get a delta AB anymore because we've got an atomic variable here, P, and another atomic variable, P. In fact, this P isn't simply a P, it's P sub I, and this one here is P sub J. So this is P sub I and P sub J. So that's the calculation that gives you this term. The calculation that gives you, and, and that gives you, all yeah, right, we've seen that. So then we have this one. And so for this one, what we get is P K prime P I dot A uh, X I T C K K prime times C K K prime P J dot H A of X J and T A K. And now the and we're going to be we're going to sort of merge into the continuum limit, so assume that no k k prime or k k and k prime are different. So then this thing turns out to be h bar over two epsilon zero b squared of omega omega prime times um, p k prime p i dot uh, epsilon r of k a r of k um, c k k prime times c k k prime p j dot epsilon r star of k prime uh, a k and let me, I'm at, in, in one shot, I'm going to make the dipole approximation and the, uh, and go to this, um, limit. So we're making the dipole approximation. And so this thing is going to be e to the minus i omega k t1 plus i omega k prime t2. Oh, and this is a t2. And, sorry, I left out a creation operator. A dagger k prime here. And so, the rest of this then is that the, the annihilation operator annihilates the K, just leaves you with K primes, and so that all gives you one. And then over here, the creation operator takes this state into that state, and so you can get rid of these guys, and this, and that. And so now you're left with uh, just the time phase factors. And this, of course, gives you the diagram where k comes in. This is the state p, c, k, k prime. This is a, this is b, that's k prime. All right. So the rest of this calculation, which we'll finish up on Wednesday, involves um, doing the time, the t1 and t2 integrals. And then for, you, get, you get a number of terms. Some of them are resonant, some of them are non-resonant. You throw away some of the non-resonant terms, and you also throw away some of the resonant terms, because there are certain resonant terms which correspond to the initial photon being resonant with an excitation from the state A to some state C. And um, that, those are terms that generate what's called resonant fluorescence. And that's a separate topic. So you don't want to consider that. All right, well, we better quit now. Um, any questions?